So thanks a lot, uh, Anne, for, for the introduction. Uh, as Anne mentioned, I'm going to be talking about the lessons learned from integrating HIV and NCD at service delivery level. And I'm going to focus the, the talk on a systematic review we have been doing for the past, I think I have to say, for the past two years. So it has had a few challenges, <laughs> as you can gather from uh, the length. Uh, normally, they don't take so long. So what I will try to explain today is the different models of integrations that we have identified. We, I'm going to give you around a, a globe, uh, hopefully a tour of the globe of five examples. Then I'm going to discuss some of the barriers to integration and finally a few conclusions. So as I, as I mentioned, the systematic review, we started, I think it started uh, when I was in the AIDS conference in Washington. And there I started seeing that people were discussing a lot HIV, but finally uh, NCDs were being thrown into the mixture and they were being discussed. And I thought, why not do a systematic review on this topic? I've talked to lots of experts and I myself had already done a systematic review on HIV and tuberculosis. So I had a feeling that there was not much out there. So I thought it's going to be a straightforward systematic review only to find out that we decided, OK, because there's not much published on the topic, there's not much research. We're going to include mental health. We're going to include substance abuse and we're going to include the world. So <laughs> we started with this premise and we ended up with 10,000 uh, papers. We managed to screen down to around 100 that fulfilled the, the inclusion criteria, which was already a lot. And the one month just before the conference, I thought, oh, I have to update and discuss with my colleagues that are here. We have to update because our, our, uh, the screening was a bit outdated. It was a few months. And I thought, normally, I'm experienced with that. So I knew that I would get maybe five extra papers, 10 extra papers, only to find out that three weeks before this conference, we had 55 extra papers to, to screen. So anyway. This is not only to mention that uh, we've been working very hard to, 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 to be able to present in this event, but also to emphasize, most importantly, that most of the research that has been done in this area has completely escalated in the last year. So here, if you see the progression, 2012, 2014, and it's only the few, uh, it's January and February 2014, we have more than 50 papers. In terms of the type of studies, we decided to include papers, abstracts, and even descriptions, because the idea was first to map what is out there. And we are also uh, very much aware that it's only one very small component of what is actually happening, because they need to be published papers or abstracts. We found 50 descriptive studies, 83 observational studies, 15 randomized controlled trials, qualitative research. So in total, we had 155 papers. In terms of uh, where the papers uh, geographically, uh, where they come from, so not surprisingly, we had nearly 100 from the USA. Then we had five from Canada. We had only three in Latin America, 15 in Europe, 17 in Asia, and 26 in Africa. And those that are published in Africa, most of them, most, more than half of them, were published in the last year. Now, the models of care that we have identified. And this might change slightly because uh, this is a preliminary analysis and I need some double checking here. The way to structure it, because it was a, a bit chaotic, all the, all the different integrations models that we had, different countries, uh, I decided that the best way to organize it would be thinking of the patient. So where does the patient en enter the healthcare service? So on the left side or your right side, you have a HIV service entry and most of the integrating uh, services come from HIV services. Then we have the entry from an NCD service. We have very few here. And here I've put in the middle a bit lower, primary healthcare integrated. Then we differentiate it between screen and refer, and then what we could call full integration, which includes also treatment. And here you can see the different models. So we go from cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, substance abuse, mental health, hepatitis. And then here we have NCD entries, particularly substance abuse. And then we had some chronic disease programs like the ones that have been described earlier. Full integration, mostly it's mental health with HIV. And now I'm going to give you, I've selected five examples from all of these models. So in total we have 14 models, just to illustrate a bit what has been done 
and to give you an example of each continent. So first we start with the map and here we have uh, the uh, HIV prevalence. So I'm going to zoom in and I hope it works. And uh, we're going to look, you the starting point we have estimated HIV prevalence. And first we're going to an example in the US. <laughs> it works, it works. <laughs> so we've got, uh, this is major depressive disorder, 3.73%. Uh, we haven't included others, but we have schizophrenia anxiety because the model we're going to be looking at, so 3.73%, we're going to be looking at Baltimore, and the model we are discussing here is the uh, integration of hepatitis and HIV within a mental health clinic. So this was a randomized controlled trial. We had uh, 236 uh, patients, and it included screening for HIV, hepatitis, A, B, and also there was uh, some counseling uh, to, with the purpose of reducing risks. And the findings are very kind of straightforward. So the intervention group screening really uh, went, went up for, for the different for hepatitis C, uh, hepatitis B and HIV, but referral continued the same. But the biggest uh, uh, problem with this model was that there was no reduction in risk behavior. And this is an area that has come up already this morning. One of the key components is how do we reduce uh, risk behavior? So now we're going to Argentina. So here we are focusing on cervical cancer with the prevalence of 0 0.5. And the model we are focusing on is integration of HIV and cervical cancer screening. And here I've chosen two examples because as we've seen this morning, even within the models that we've identified, there are different ways and different uh, interventions have been proposed. So that's why it complicates a bit more the whole systematic review because within each model, there are sub-models. And this is uh, the case of uh, Argentina where we have Hospital Juan Fernandez, and it was an integrated service where they were providing pap smear and col colposcopy uh, in 96 uh, women and HIV women, and they found 23% they had abnormalities. And from those, 30% had abnormal growth of squamous cells. And the authors agreed that in this case, the integration was successful, particularly if we take into account the percentages. So now we move into Africa. And here, I have to say that we have some of the most interesting papers, and they have been presented already, so I thought I would only focus on a different one. And we're going to Mozambique, and it's also it's also cervical cancer, but a different intervention. So here we have integration of HIV and cervical cancer, but using visual inspection. And this is, uh, as Sally mentioned uh, this morning, in uh, limited resource settings, this is a cheaper option. And it was done in a screening in 4,651 women. And they found, and this was HIV negative and positive. And what they found is they judged it positive 8%. And 4% of those had uh, lesions, and then they were referred to, to other services. However, the paper does highlight some of the barriers already that we'll discuss later, which are staffing sh shortages and the staff are pulled to, to cover for, from other areas. And unfortunately, some of the referrals will not follow up and that percentage was quite high. So now we're going again to Cambodia. And here we are focusing on uh, hypertension and diabetes. 10% of DALIs, 1.3 of diabetes. And this is an interesting case because uh, uh, before I started the systematic review, it was considered as one of the kind of uh, best examples. And there are, few, there are several publications on this case study, and some published by international organizations are very positive, some others are a bit more critical. So I've tried to give like a, a mixture of, uh, of both views. So this is an MSF uh, pilot program. Excuse me, so it has uh, two chronic disease clinics for HIV, diabetes and hypertension. 
And the very interesting finding here is that after 24 months on ARTs, there were only 3% of HIV patients lost to care, but there were 30% of diabetes patients lost to care after only 24 months. And the more positive uh, uh, percentage is on hypertension, which is 68%. Now, when the authors of the paper tried to analyze why this was happening, and this is also confirmed by some of research that we've done on hypertension, diabetes was not seen as life-threatening by some of the patients, and therefore they stopped accessing the services. And we have seen this also with our work we've done with Pablo and Martin McKee, on hypertension in Colombia, where I was interviewing patients, and the least of the worries was hypertension. So I was interviewing them for around two hours. They were talking about all the uh, surgery that they had done, those that were HIV positive, they were talking about the problems they had, and then after like one hour and a half, I was like, and you hypertension? Because I was aware that they were hypertensive. They were like, ah, yes. Like, the, it was really the least of the concerns. And now, I hope you don't mind, I'm a bit biased here, but we're going to Spain. And this is a, I thought it would be a good last example. We're going to programs on, so the, the balance is 1.8% in Spain. And we're going to an integrated service substance abuse and HIV. Here we have, I think, around 50 papers uh, from the States. But I, I chose uh, this uh, program because Spain has been, has many programs on, on substance abuse and they've been very successful over the years and they already started in the 80s so this one is in one of the most beautiful hospitals we have in spain it's called hospital del mar so this is the waiting zone and this is the views that you can see from the waiting uh, waiting area for the patients <laughs> but having said that it's not only about having beautiful hospitals because what they realized in this hospital is that patients uh, that, they, that they were uh, using drugs, they didn't come to the hospital, so they decided to create an outpatient clinic nearer where they lived. And they compared both, and they, uh, they, had, uh, they compared a group that was uh, using drugs and a group that was not uh, using drugs but attending the hospital. And what they found out is that they, they had all the, those that they were using drugs, they had the worst starting point, after uh, it was integrated and in the outpatient clinic, uh, the, it greatly improved the efficacy for ARTs, for the group that were drug users and going to outpatient care. So we've seen uh, five different models. Now I just want to conclude with uh, some of the barriers that we've seen from all the papers to integrating services. And here what we did was, in each of the papers, we had the health systems framework, the WHO framework, and we've incorporated all the barriers that uh, were reported in the papers. So I was looking at the summarizing the, the key areas that were discussed in all the models. And for most of the models, the ineffective referral systems that we've already seen with the, the several models I've discussed. There is a lack of uh, staff trained to manage both conditions and lots of issues around task shifting, particularly with nurses, and them being overburdened. We found a lot of papers discussing particularly uh, mental health, substance abuse, and HIV on staff attitudes and having different cultures and being very difficult to, to work uh, together. Then for the patient, the one that is highlighted all the time is the issue of transport costs, but also costs once they are Refer to, uh, refer to another service than the one that is normally provided integrated. And also, uh, we had problems with the availability of, uh, of some of the, of the drugs. And another issue that was discussed uh, a lot was the fact that some of these programs were not responsive to the patients, particularly for drug users when they were integrating with HIV. So to conclude, in general, we've seen loads of innovative uh, approaches to develop integrating services. I think the key area here is to remember from the part of the, the healthcare professional that they're not uh, in the different cultures and different services, that is only one uh, patient. 
And from the part of the patient, I think we need some health education in terms of uh, providing an understanding of what NCDs and what are the risks associated. And we did find in lots of uh, those that the services were, it was an NCD and then HIV was integrated, where there was still stigma attached of people that they were HIV negative attending those services. So that, that was a key issue also. And to finalize, uh, what I've been discussing, it's a lot of service delivery, small projects, and we need to take into account, and although we're trying to find the best ways of them to work, it's very important that it really depends, and that's why I was showing you the burden of disease in the different areas, depends on the prevalence of, of specific disease, also the characteristics of the healthcare system. We've seen different healthcare systems where Argentina would work, but maybe in Mozambique something different could work. Very important that this solutions are country-led, and this is mentioned by the kind of a discussion in, in, in a lot of the papers. And the final point, and perhaps the most uh, difficult to, to express, I need to drink water for this one. So we need, <laughs> we need the, the right resources and leadership. And what I mean by that is that we do know that some of these services are for the most vulnerable drug users that uh, HIV infected with mental health problems, and that in some countries, it is true that maybe in Africa they, they also have priorities in terms of uh, putting into treatment those newly infected, which hasn't, all that has gone down. We still have lots of new infections every year. But it's also very important to mention that leadership is needed also in those countries. And here I'm going to include countries that have been doing work on, like Portugal, Greece, England, and Spain where services for those that are most vulnerable, most in need, are completely being stopped. So the, I wanted to give you the example of Spain, very beautiful example, nice hospital nurse. I've been discussing this topic with all of these services, which normally are provided by volunteer organizations, and it hasn't gone down 10%, 20 30 Most of them have been stopped. So I think also as a community in terms of researchers and, and practice, we need to be aware of these limitations that we're living particularly in uh, those countries that have been affected by the financial crisis. Thanks a lot.